Rockin' Night is. I want to go to heaven, but I've been told The Rockin' Night has got my soul Baby is still at home. Wonder if my baby is still at home. Hi, cats and kittens. Welcome to Rockinitis. My name is Michael Wilmore. And my special guest here is Rob Frith, who has a great record store between 19th and 20th in Vancouver. Thank you. Yeah. Called Neptune Records. Yes. So we're going to do a show on Paul Revere and the Raiders. And the Raiders were right in on the ground floor of the Northwest Sound from the very beginning. Basically, at this point, they were based in Portland. And they met a, a disc jockey called Roger Hart and he became their manager. So anyway, they became the house band at the Headless Horseman, and uh, they alternated with Gentleman Jim and the Horseman. And whenever Paul Revere went on tour, uh, Gentleman Jim and the Horseman would take over, and he produced their second album on Sanday Records, and it was later re-released on the Jordan record label. And we can actually see that now they, they're incorporating the Paul Revere and the Raiders outfits on this second LP. Well, oh, you've got the Sanday cover as well? Yeah. Can you stick that up there? The original cover, and then it was re reissued then on Jordan with the cartoon uh, cover. With well, this, the... this actually was in color. This came out of a box set. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's a really cool box set. I know you've got a copy yourself, the, uh, the Northwest Collection. This one right here. It was, um, I don't know, when did it come out? Like about 25, 30 years ago? Yeah, something that? like that. Yeah. Anyway, the guy that put out the uh, Northwest Sound box set, the one that you're just seeing right there, uh, I wrote an article in the Vancouver Sun uh, newspaper way back in uh, 1980. And this article here was about uh, all the bands included on the Northwest Sound box set. And Bob Jenniker, the guy who put out the Northwest Sound box set, he said this was the greatest single synopsis that he'd ever read on the Northwest Sound. Oh, like, really? like a capsule uh, short version of what the Northwest Sound was. So that was high praise. Yeah, Bob Jenniker is a real good friend of mine. And uh, yeah. it was, uh, you know, he passed away about 20 years ago, but yeah, he was a great guy. He put out a lot of reissues over the years, mm -hmm. some great stuff. It's the other band. Um, shoot, I'm trying to think. Well, he had a band, band called The Moving Targets. Visible Targets. Visible Targets. But he also yeah. put out like one of the early Wipers albums. Okay. Like, yeah, kind of the earlier sort of punk, garagey bands, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so let's get to the... Uh, oh, Daily Flash, that was the other one I was trying to think oh, of. Oh, was he, was he manager of Daily no, Flash? No, he put the record out. Oh, that, okay. That oh, that reissue of it. Yeah. That's a good album. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great group. Yeah, yeah, I know. I saw them on the same bill with The Grateful Dead. Oh, really? Yeah, at uh, Retinal Circus. They, uh, did they play at the um, Trips Festival in Richmond as well? Probably. They played here yeah. a couple of times. Yeah. They were great. Anyway, where are we at here? Okay, so... We're going to play a couple of things now off the Paul Revere and the Raiders second LP. And this is the second cover, not the original Sanday cover. And we'll hear uh, a couple of things that was one of them here. This is the second LP. It was actually recorded in 10 hours. <laughs> 10 hours. And it was produced by Roger Hart, the disc jockey. And uh, we'll hear a couple of things off it. An instrumental called Blues Stay Away, which is actually 
Blue Stay Away From Me, which was originally by the Delmore Brothers, which was an old country and western yeah. type group. And I've got it on the Canadian quality record label. So we'll hear Blue Stay Away From Me and Mojo Workout, which was uh, originally by Larry Bright. This guy right here, he did the original version of Mojo Workout. But this is the cover on the second LP. <laughs> oh, that's This is actually the second version of Paul Revere and the Raiders because the first one was based in Boise, Idaho and it had a different rhythm section with Mark Lindsay and Paul Revere fronting. And then this is a, a second version of guys that they met and, and coalesced with around Portland, Oregon. Yeah. So uh, the group actually had different phases, different stages and stuff like that. And uh, it all kind of took off when they met their manager, Roger Hart. And uh, he put them on tour throughout the Pacific Northwest. And um, he started booking them all over the place. And uh, he produced their second album, uh, recorded in 10 hours. And this was all before the Beatles, incidentally. That's, that's very important, I think. Oh, yeah. Because I, I sort of feel like if the Northwest sound had been allowed to continue just the way it was already going, it may have become the sound of the 60s. Like if you can remove the British invasion from your consciousness, if that had never happened, probably the Northwest sound would have expanded oh, and, become, sure. and become the sound of the 60s for a time. You know? Well, I mean, the, I mean, the Raiders sort of progressed naturally, bef you know, even before the Beatles into, yeah. into a more grittier, garagey, cool sound. But when the, when the British invasion happened, everybody stopped in their tracks and started doing that. Yeah. And so it, it literally cut off whole schools of music that were totally doing their thing. I mean, surf guitar and all these other schools of music, Tamla Motown, all these things, had to suddenly stop what they were doing and be influenced by the thing that was taking over, which was the British invasion. Right, and even that even happened to Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah, <laughs> well, so I mean, really, they did really well during the uh, British invasion. Yes, they did because uh, they were able to adapt. Yeah, because they they weren't all that different uh, in a lot of ways from what the Rolling Stones were doing. Mm -hmm. So they kind of picked up on what the Rolling Stones were doing and incorporated they it. They even toured with the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Okay, and they incorporated it to their sound. Yeah. Yeah. But so, they, they headlined, I think. Paul, Paul Revere? Revere? Yeah. Over think, the Stones? I think so, yeah. Really? It was their first tour. I don't think the Stones uh, were that popular. You know, anyway, the first time, I, I only saw Paul Revere and the Raiders once. Yeah. And it was at the Kitsilino Showboat in 1964. 
There's a... And their record then was Sometimes. Yeah, I love and that Over record. You. Uh, Here's the Kitsilano Showboat audience. Oh, great. You got an actual photo of that? Yeah. I'm not, I, it's, not, it's not Paul Revere on the stage. It's just a, it shows, it's from the stage looking out. Okay. So you can see how many people would show up at this. We should explain the Kitsilano Showboat. I'm sure a lot of people don't know what it is. Well, it's, a, a, it's right at Kit's pool. Yeah. And it's a stage in front of the pool. And they played an outdoor live concert, Paul Revere and the Raiders, in 1964 that was free. And I pedaled down on my bike, and I got there about an hour early, and I was the first one there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I kind of lashed my bike to a pole, yeah. and then got a super good seat, and just sort of sat there and waited. And, and they were absolutely tremendous. They were tremendous. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, they, were, they, were, like, they would do stuff like they would romp around on the stage. They had the most incredible stage show. And they would, they would kind of like swing their guitars like this. And the other guy, you know, the bass guitar would be ducking as the lead guitar would be swinging over his head. Yeah. Right? And then they, one guy would be doing the Raider stomp, kicking his feet out like this, with another guy on his shoulders. And anyway, they were really, really entertaining in full uniform. And it was just fabulous. Well, Drake Levin and, and um, Phil Volk were friends. They'd, they'd known each other for a long time. And uh, Phil Volk was a, his family were kind of in the entertainment business. And, uh, and Phil Volk was a tap dancer. Okay. So he, had, he was like this you know, ace dancer. So he brought in a lot of those sort of, you know, the choreography of those like dance steps and stuff like that, that when he joined the band and really you know, changed it a lot. Well, what polished it a lot more, and and, and looked like, like just so easy. Like they, they were, it looked like there there was no effort at all for them to do it. Well, what happened was Paul Revere when he was a child, he his dad took him to see this guy called Spike Jones, and Spike Jones basically had a band that were like superlative super musicians, but they would goof around on the stage and do, you know, kibitzing on the stage, and they were basically a, like a comedy show? Yeah. Like, sort of like Victor Borgie. Well, and, and they're kind of like the Marx Brothers as well. Yeah, Marx Brothers, Victor yeah. Borgie, that kind of thing. But the dad kept saying to Paul Revere, who was just a child, he kept saying to him, you know, they were really good musicians. Like, don't let the comedy fool you. Right. These guys are really good musicians. So all his life, as a child growing up, Paul Revere thought, his ambition would be to have a group that were super good musicians, but would fool around like crazy on the stage. And that that would be en totally entertaining. And then everybody would go, but you know, deep down, they're really good musicians. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and, and all of that's true yeah. for that band. They just did. Un so they Spike so Jones was a super influence on Paul Revere, funny. on his psyche kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway, Paul Revere Dick, born in 1938. And Mark Lindsay was born in 1942, and they started in Boise, Idaho in 1959. Originally, they were called the Downbeats, uh, an all-instrumental band in the beginning, and they actually had an instrumental LP and a half a dozen instrumental singles. And then Paul got drafted uh, and used this conscientious objector status and uh, served his one and a half years in the Army or Navy or whatever, basically by working in a mental hospital as a cook. Yeah. So he got kind of got out of the service. Yeah, peeling potatoes. Yeah, peeling potatoes and that kind of stuff. So Mark Lindsay joined him there in Portland, and he formed a new group uh, managed by Portland DJ Roger Hart. <laughs> Thank uh -huh. 
Louie Louie was a song that had been kicking around in the repertoire of every Northwest band ever since the first revival hit version by the Whalers in 1961. They were from Tacoma, Washington. It had originally been written and recorded by Richard Berry in 1957, an R&B singer based in Los Angeles. Paul Revere and the Raiders version was recorded in 1963 in the same studio on Northwest 10th Avenue as the international hit version by the competing Portland group, The Kingsman. The first issue of the Raiders version was on Roger Hart's Sand Day record label, and the flip side was the instrumental Night Train, originally by Jimmy Forrest, and later popularized by James Brown. The local Sand Day release is what got them a contract with Columbia Records. Paul Revere and the Raiders were the first rock group signed to Columbia Records. The follow-up single was sort of an answer record called Louie Go Home, and it was intended to put Louie Louie to rest. This was an original written by Mark Lindsay and Paul Revere of the Raiders, although Mark actually sings Louie Come Back Home, if you listen carefully to the words. And the tune was later covered in England by David Bowie and his Lower Third Band, somewhat out of context to the song's Northwest history and lineage. And the flip side was the Raiders' cover version of Richard Berry's other best-known song, Have Love, Will Travel. It was also covered later by the Sonics. Well, Rob, we have a special prop here today that's uh, a pair of special sunglasses. And when you activate them, as I'm going to do now, you get to see a special vision. So when you listen to music, you get to see a special vision that you wouldn't ordinarily see if you weren't wearing these. So let's put them on and put them on and we'll look at something that you wouldn't ordinarily see when you listen to music. Oh, I think I hear it approaching now. Here it comes. Peter's gone. 
an ugly face. <laughs> but you watch me stroke this face. We shout at you, and you'll shout back and see if you can't blow us off the stage. Yeah. Yo! 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 Wow! Yeah! Wow! Yeah! All right, you people out. Any people over there? Yeah! yeah. And standing over there? Yeah! yeah. And you over there in the corner? Yeah! People over there? Yeah. And on the rug? Yeah. On the floor? Yeah. On the ceiling? Yeah. They over there? Yeah. And I all around the whole scope of humanity? Yeah. 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 I'm gonna tell you yeah. about oop poop. It was early 1964 now, and Beatlemania and the British Invasion exploded into the American music industry, changing and influencing everything. Because the Raiders had such a strong reputation as a live performing visual act, Columbia Records thought it would be a good idea to bring the Raiders into the studio to do a live gig in front of an invited audience of employees and their families and friends. This in-house concert was recorded in 1964, but not released until 2013. So we heard a few songs from that live concert as well. And uh, because every, virtually every Northwest group included the song in their live act, and because there were so many Northwest recorded versions of Louie Louie, there was a movement in later years to make it Washington's state song. And here's an item I saved out of the newspaper. Louie Louie anthem pushed Olympia, Washington. About 3,000 people thronged the Capitol steps Friday to sing Louie Louie, the 1960s rock tune that is the baby boomers tongue-in-cheek candidate for the official state song. Participants pledged to support a state song we can dance to. <laughs> Members of the Kingsmen, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and one member of the Whalers joined Thurston County Commissioner George Barner and his rock band, the Trendsetters, and the Ferndale High School Orchestra 
to perform a rousing version of the song with new lyrics written in honor of Washington State. Resolutions to make Louie Louie the state song were presented on both floors of the legislature, but both houses stood by Washington My Home, written by Helen Davies, 79, of South Bend. So um, my favorite Northwest versions are the Whalers version, the Sonics version, both groups from Tacoma, and the Feelys version from Seattle. Well, we'll have to end off now. This has been part two of Paul Revere and the Raiders, and believe me, there's a lot more to come. Right. It looks like, uh, you know, it started out, we were originally planning this as being a four-part show, but once we get talking, we don't know when to stop, <laughs> <laughs> basically. So, um, you know, we're basically, it's probably going to end up being five or six parts. Yeah. Anyway, so I think we'll end off here. This is the... Paul Revere and the Raiders in the beginning segment. My name is Michael Wilmore. My guest is Rob Frith. Thanks very much for viewing. Rock and Night is. Oh, doctor, doctor, tell me what to do. He said, don't stop rocking something you are through. Doctor, doctor, what's the matter with me? He said the rock and itis won't let you be. Well, I tried to stop rocking, but I've been told. Rock and itis has got my soul. 